Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our discussion of what we are calling our Big Five. That is to say, when we talk about meeting titles when we meet texts, there's a number of different ways that we will annotate them. And one of the popular ways in 303 that we do that is the use of what we call the Big Five. Now, <clears throat> the assumption is that at LearnStrong.net you have already been following our stuff and a set of introductory comments. I'm hopeful that you've already, you've already watched and listened to that. And now we are ready to begin the process of the first of our Big Five, epistemology. Epistus, overrelated to knowledge, obviously ology, the study of. So technically, epistemology is nothing more than the study of knowledge. That is to say, what exactly can you actually know? Now we often say in 303 that we are the stories that we tell. We're the stories that we retell. We are the stories that we decide to accept or to reject. And of course, to say we are the stories that we tell is in one way um, thinking about what we can know. Epistemology is one of these important stories. That is to say, what can we know for sure? I mean, think about the power of Plato's Republic, Book 7, the cave allegory, and you'll, you'll remember this story, individuals sitting chained up in a cave, they can only see forward, they cannot see behind them, there's a fire burning behind them, people walk from outside of the cave into the cave casting shadows on the wall, and the poor folks that are sitting there chained up look at the shadows that are being cast on the wall because of the fire behind, and the poor people who are sitting there chained up, they actually believe they are certain that they know that those shadows are real. It is only, of course, when one of the young, right, that's important in our analysis, we've given a full analysis of this at LearnStrong.net, the, 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 the Republican, especially Republic 7. But just to remind, a young man is released and he is immediately blown away. But then outside of his comfort zone, he has to be chained back up. Of course, the emancipator, i.e. the teacher, will drag this young man, kicking and screaming, we're told, remember the power of fear and pain as it relates to learning, out into the light of the sun where he is, of course, can we say it together, quote, blinded by the light. But it takes a while for his eyes to grow accustomed to the light and then slowly he begins to see shapes and images and then finally he can see everything. He sees the sun as the source of all light to recognize that the fire inside of the cave is a small kind of subset of the bright sun outside. And it is in that moment that for Socrates, the student gains, what's that word that we love to use in 303? Perspicacity. Now that word sounds a lot like perspective for a reason because there's this thing called Outside and inside. Outside, I see you sitting there. Inside, I don't mean that I roll my eyes into the back of my head and I see my brain. No, no. Insight. That is to say understanding, knowledge. What is it that's true versus maybe not so much true in terms of our knowledge? That's the question of epistemology. Now, when we come to epistemology, and now this is just a general understanding of the science, then there really is three kinds of epistemological positions that one can hold, okay? About anything one says one knows, A, uh, if you're writing this on your paper, just draw a line. And all the way on the far left there, write A. And underneath A, put the absolutist epistemological position. Well, what is that? Well, it's simple. Whatever I hold to be true, whatever I hold to be knowledge, is absolutely true and absolutely certain. I hold it that way. There is no doubt whatsoever the absolutist position, of course, is a position that can be held. I mean, as we've said often in 303, you ain't met no 200-year-old no people. That is to say, it's pretty much an absolute, at least right now, we could argue, that they ain't no 200-year-old people living on this planet. Okay? But the problem epistemologically with the absolutist position is that a lot of times people will do things assuming that they have an absolutist epistemological position and they do some really horrific things. We think of course of the tragedies in American history, the flying of airplanes into buildings and lots of people dying because of an absolutist epistemological position. Which leads us to the other end of the spectrum, and yes, this is an epistemological perspective that is a spectrum as we're talking about it, all the way to the far end. On the complete opposite of the absolutist epistemological position is the relativist position. Now, what's the relativist position? Well, the relativist position says, well, there is nothing that you can know absolutely. There is nothing that you can know really at all. Everything that you can know epistemologically is relative, contingent in some way. The extreme position is to say there is no truth. There are no absolutes of any kind. I had a student 
who graduated from 303, went on to the university, and took in her very first semester an intro to philosophy class in a room with some 300 other students. She arrived, she sat down, the professor walked in with a little bit of swagger, as she would tell the story later to me, and he stood in the front of them, and the very first thing he said was, there is no truth. There are no absolutes. There is no truth. If you're interested in that, get up now and leave. My student reporting to me, I knew I shouldn't do it, Mr. McGee, but I had to raise my hand, and he was stunned that I would be asking a question on the very first day, in the very first minutes of class. Yes, a question. Thank you. Yes, a question. She said, yeah, I do, I do have a question. You just said there is no truth. Well, he laughed with the rest of the group to make them all laugh. Well, at least we have a freshman who knows how to listen. Thank you. I'm very happy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My student said, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I heard. I heard you said there is no truth. I only have one question. Oh, good. So hurry and ask your question so I can get on to my lecture. Uh, the thing you just said, there is no truth. Are we expected to believe that's true? And she said there was this weird ripple that went across the room of the other 300 students as they all went, ah, oh, okay, so what's he going to do with this? And my student said, so I followed up with an observation. For you to say there is no truth is to posit a truth. Are you not? For you to say there is no absolute is to posit an absolute, that there is no absolute. And to that degree, you've engaged in what I think is called the performative contradiction is that right? Well, let's just say that the prof wanted to know where she had been educated and then, of course, ask her quickly to leave the class. The performative contradiction is what we call, really, the way in which the relative position epistemologically usually falls on its face. But our problem epistemologically is, what if I don't want to hold an absolutist position about things I believe to, to, that I know? But I clearly understand there's got to be some kind of truth. I mean, obviously, there's some, there's some capacity to epistemologically hold a position. I mean, not every, no, everything can't be relative. Where do I stand on this spectrum? And if you are drawing it on your paper, and I hope that you are, you have a center position. And this is the position that we hope, epistemologically, we can come to in room 303. It is what we will call, in room 303, the fallibilist position. Now, to be fallible means what? Well, I'm capable of error. What is the fallibilist position epistemologically? Well, it's the position of science, right? It says the following about anything I think I know. I say the following. I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. That I could be wrong part is central to the fallibilist position. In other words, we say the following. It's not that I don't believe in anything. And it's not that I assume that what I know is absolutely true. Rather, I take a position epistemologically that says the following. I think I'm right about what I think I know. And I'm going to go ahead and begin to act as if I'm right. But I am looking for, and here's the key word, data. If I can find data that disproves my epistemological position, I'm willing to change my mind. This is, of course, what we would call basic science. This is what the Enlightenment was all about. The notion that we could in fact challenge our epistemological positions and if we were proved wrong, we were willing to adjust them. When science no longer does this, we have a term for that, it's called scientism, and scientism is just the absolutist epistemological position. Now, as we are thinking about our cave allegory from Plato's Republic 7, think about the power of what true learning is. We look at the shadows on the wall if we're chained up, and we are absolutely certain that what we're looking at as shadows are, in fact, real. It's not to say that those shadows don't exist. We know they exist. We're just arguing they're not real. In some fundamental way, they're not real. And when the young emancipated student is able to go up and touch the wall and to see, oh, these are shadows on a wall, and behind me all this time has been a fire burning, and people walking, casting shadows up on the wall, and that's what makes me think this stuff is all real. Of course, once the student is fully emancipated, can we say it now? Enlightened. Oh. See how Plato's playing with that term. Outside of the cave, outside of the darkness of the cave, of course, yes, the student is able to know in a different way. 
right? Of course, that knowledge is foundational to the beginning of wisdom, or virtues, as Plato will reference it. And of course, ultimately, this epistemological position of fallibilism is going to lead to freedom. The idea that once you know things, then you can be free of some of the constraints in your knowledge. Now, we must accept, and to that degree, we got to decide what it is we're going to qualify as knowledge for us. That is to say, these stories are going to differ depending upon who we are, which will lead us to the next of our big five, the ontological question, the simple question, who are you? And it's a fascinating question. It's one of the oldest questions in the history of the world. And of course, we're going to find ourselves immediately engaged in dualisms. Obviously, I'm a body, but I may be more than that. And maybe even beyond dualism to a trinity that we will argue is maybe where a lot of great texts are taking us. Thank you. Come back for our discussion of ontology.